you do the contact finger read. Okay. Now we, uh... hey everybody, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're on SketchUp Live episode four. My name is Josh. Over here in the festive Santa t-shirt is Aaron. And Hi. our guest today is John Brock, who's Hello. a custom builder from Virginia, who is also a bit of a SketchUp ninja. A ninja. Ninja. Josh kind of throws that term around. Let's don't talk about your head or anything. I'll take it. Yeah. Take it. Uh, I good. got a cool SketchUp face now, too. <laughs> <laughs> so John has really taken advantage of SketchUp and the SketchUp API. He's not only incorporated SketchUp heavily into the way he designs and reviews buildings before building them, but actually has some extensions that we're going to look at today. Um, one thing I want to throw is, as, as we're going through here, if you guys have any questions for John, post them up right in here in, in Facebook, put a question, and we'll try to address as many as possible as we talk to John. So cool. welcome, first Thank off. Thank you. Thank you very much. So when did you first get into using SketchUp? Because I know you've been using it for a while in your business. It's, it's kind of a mm -hmm. big focal point in your business. But when was your first time you got into SketchUp? I um, used lots of different CAD programs, but I was using SoftPlan uh, quite heavily. And I used to do certain things that I couldn't model in there. I would use SketchUp and then import them into SoftPlan. But I got more and more wanting to be more customized, wanting to not have everything. It was, it was a parametric modeler, which was neat, but there were some things that it couldn't do or there were some limitations, whereas in SketchUp I can make it look like the exact product. Sure, sure. And, uh, and you got all the different third-party plugins and Theta and V-Ray, great rendering programs. So I just decided that was the course I was going to go. That's great. And we first met John back in about 2015 in Atlanta uh, during the AIA conference. And what was kind of surprising to us about John is how amazing his SketchUp models were in terms of detail. So a lot of, a lot of stuff drawn, uh, really amazing detail shown in the actual 3D model. And that kind of leads us into a little bit about what you have now called Estimator for SketchUp, which is yeah. an extension available on the Extension Warehouse. <clears throat> yeah, actually, I left, I left AIA that time going, you know, I don't think that they're going to do an estimating program. I felt like I really wanted it, and so I reached out to some programmers and found a guy that would do it for me. So. The whole idea was that everything lived inside of the SketchUp file. So, you know, uh, I wanted to not have to leave SketchUp in order to get my full estimate. Because a lot of programs, you know, you'll, you'll export it to Excel and clean it up. Well, then the client makes a change. I'm a custom builder, so clients make changes constantly. <laughs> and so, you, well, did I make the change here? Did I make it over there? So the goal with Estimator was that it was 100% inside of SketchUp. You didn't have to leave. And uh, so any change you make in SketchUp, and it's real-time reporting. So whatever you, you know, assign a price to something and you replicate it five times, you'll get five times the cost. Awesome. So we can take a look at it, right? Sure. Sure. Right. Yeah, let's jump in there. Uh, this, is a, this is actually a sample file or a model that I, I give away um, with Estimator just so you can have an idea of what it can do. Uh, this house is fully modeled. Um, everything has a price associated with it. Down if I clicked on a column, you'll see how much the column costs as soon as it wakes up. And then you can report out anything that you select. Uh, but I do take it all the way from the foundation up, all the way through all the framing. So for instance, if I looked at the main floor framing, you can see that it's every stud, every header, everything is in, the sheathing. I even put the Tyvek texture on the outside. I want my clients to see exactly how each phase is going to look um, and know what to expect. Yeah, it's pretty close to what you actually will have in, in the real world, so it's, it's kind of nice to yeah. be modeling in, in 3D and in pixels, but it's very close to what's going to happen on site. Right. Well, and what started the whole um, push for Estimator, or the goal for it, was that I could model this pretty roof. Well, how many squares of shingles is it going to take to put on there? Yeah. And so the way I've got it set up is, you know, you can actually get purchase orders out of this. So, for instance, if I looked at, uh, there's roof framing, if I looked at uh, just the roof framing package, all these rafters, because I would order them separately. So I can just select everything that is my rafters that I have in there, and then I can just run a report, the nice HTML report, and that's all my materials. And with Estimator, you can put your own company logo in there, your company information. This is a generic version that I have on there right now, but you can then print it or save it as a PDF. In this case, I just send it to my salesman as a purchase order. I love this because it's not just modeling to make it look good or for aesthetics. Everything you draw actually has a pretty unique purpose, and yeah. down the line really can help you, you know, do a takeoff like this, which is very useful. Yes, and and really the the beauty of it too is anything that you save uh, as a component. For instance, like this column that I was clicking on, if I was to save that to my library, the next time I bring that over, I already have all this cost data associated with it, so I don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. 
Uh, same token if I'd already assigned, uh, you know, like a lot of times the clients will see something like this gable texture, these shakes versus lap siding. And there's a big cost difference between those two. Yeah. So since the pricing is associated with that texture, just that simple act, if they say, well, how much would that be using the shakes? And I can just paint it with that texture and it instantly tell them how much. And yeah. they're making their decisions like that versus, hey, let me get back to you. Right. So yeah, that's information that's nice to know mm -hmm. right when you ask the question. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And this is, you know, customized to this model, but any other texture that you bring in, that's the beauty. SketchUp lets you use any texture you want. So I can go and pick up, you know, like this is a rock texture that I've used before. So I literally took a picture of the house that I'd used it on and made a seamless texture in Photoshop. So uh, let's just back up one step here to show people maybe how this works from basic geometry. So can you go off sure. to the side, maybe do a quick slab or something yeah. with some basic lines? And, well, and let's just say you had a, 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 a basement slab that looked something like this, right? and you pull it up, oh, estimator's trying to work right now. Pull it up four inches, and it looks like a typical slab. Mm -hmm. Make it a group, but then if I go over and assign it to my basement slab layer, and I've already got lots of different costs associated with that. So with everything that we model, uh, we have attributes of, of length and area and volume, and so estimator lets you take whatever attribute you want as many times as you want, uh, to create as many products or byproducts of that. So now when so, I and those those values you're talking about, those are user defined, right? So I can yeah, go they're in completely and user defined. Those numbers. Yeah, the whole thing about this program is it doesn't matter if you are a home builder or you know a car builder or anything that you're using SketchUp to model and you want to report out what it is. If you were building this bench right here, or, or you know you've got tables and chairs in a conference room and you could add these things, and maybe it's a maybe it's an event planner and they're wanting to put all these tables and chairs together and get an idea of how many it would take, it will report that out. So it could be a simple thing like an interior designer needs to figure out what's in the room, what it might cost, so exactly. it could be complex or a quick takeoff. And for something like this slab, that one action that I did of creating that slab, which took a matter of seconds, I can see exactly, if I run a report on that, there's my termite protection, my quantity of concrete, my finishing labor, and my poly underlayment all in one simple thing. So you can keep using the geometry and adding as many costs as you want. So. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we had a couple questions come in. Sure. Um, Hank's asking about interfacing. So um, you do have sort of a open interface in, in your file export. You export CVS files. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You, well, you can take um, you can run a report in the HTML that you're seeing there, but you can also export it as a CSV file, yeah. and then bring that CSV file into another program. I don't have any kind of um, you know, small guy here in Virginia. I don't have a, a software company that you know that I can, <laughs> or programmers that I can get to say, hey, let's make this work with QuickBooks or something else like right. that. There is some integration you could do, like uh, for instance, my vendors mm -hmm. or your vendors that you can have either in, like in QuickBooks. I just exported the list of vendors and put that as a, one of the one of the custom files that you can have in Estimator is you can bring your own vendors in. So it's a simple file. It's a CSV file. So you just wipe out you know the ones that came with it or or, or it's blank, and then you can put your own vendors in there. So the next time you're going to enter in cost data you just, in the vendors, you just start typing your vendor's cool. name, and it auto-populates. That's nice. And it also has cost codes from NAHB, National Association of Home Builders, that are built into this, but it can be any cost codes. You can completely customize so it. So it's an option, it's but not, you don't have to use it. It just comes with it as a way of providing structure, <laughs> because it's going to report out in a code type thing. Starting with but, something. Is yeah, but you could say code 100 is whatever, code 200 is this, code whatever you want to do. That's awesome. So you can wipe it out and start from scratch. Uh, I got a question here from Daniel. I like this one because, so he, Daniel asks, how long does it take to, to model and organize? I have to like, teach in, in SketchUp that it's good to organize things up front. So with your extensions, it's actually very important to do that as you're modeling. Right. So talk a little bit about that. Uh, how you might think uh, one of the first things that I do is I, I bring in the floor plans. If, if it's one that I've already designed, I don't typically, in, in it, you know, most of the times I'm working off a set of plans because I'm building something that somebody else has designed. If I'm designing it like yeah. I did in here, um, I used SketchUp to do that. But for instance, I got the floor plans in here and I'll stack them, make sure that they overlay. Uh, properly, and then I just start building it from the ground up. I'll, put, I'll do the foundation. Now I use Profile Builder for a whole lot of uh, extru extrusions of things like these foundation walls. That's actually an assembly. That one simple action, I've got my foundation, my anchor bolts, my drain tile, and footings, and steel. You can make your own assemblies and profiles. For those that don't know, that's an extension that allows you to do it basically like the Follow Me tool, but you can um, pull profiles together and pull them along a path. 
a lot like the follow me tool, but you can do that with a bunch of profiles at once. So that's what he's talking about there. Right. It's like follow me on steroids. It's really, really <laughs> powerful. But then also each of those become a layer. So the foundation wall is on a layer, the footing is on a layer, um, and then I can use the lineal footage for my labor. I can use the cubic yardage for the concrete. So once you've got it, you can add as many costs as you want to it. And you can also report out now. You can you don't have to put a dollar amount in it, so you can actually it'll report out quantities. So I mean, literally, <clears throat> this could be used anywhere for anybody. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't it <laughs> doesn't have like to be a counter. house. It's, yeah, it's it's completely. Uh, awesome. I mean, I've got people in the aluminum extrusion industry that have purchased it and they use it for That's you know, awesome. something completely unrelated to anything I ever do. Right. But so the you know the question as far as how to organize, I literally start from the ground up, just like I'm building the house. And I, that's why my scenes, my SketchUp scenes, are in phases of construction. So you can see I've got my basement framing. You know, you can see I've got treated plates because it's going on concrete, and that's on a different layer, so that estimator will report out my treated plates. And again, it's taking it to a level that you don't have to necessarily do. I also have this takeoff length uh, uh, tool that comes with estimator that will let you c accumulate links. So you could just have your basic SketchUp model walls and then you could just pick those walls and then say, okay, use the lineal footage to determine my plates and my studs and drywall and things like that. So <clears throat> I just choose to take it to this level. You know. That's great. No, it's a great looking model too. The yeah. same, Daniel's um, asking a little bit more about different models for different purposes, but for what you're doing, it's all one model, right? It's all one model. Now, I, I run into some disagreements with, um, you know, guys like Nick Saunders and people like that that have really, really great processes and procedures that they follow. But to use Estimator, I want everything in one file. Yeah. Now, you don't have to. I mean, you could certainly do multiple files um, because my, my files do get rather large. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of lessons learned from that. And you know, we were talking <laughs> earlier about materials and making sure you're not overly bloating a file with heavy textures and things like that. That's so. a good tip. So we were talking earlier about uh, <clears throat> this, this Tyvek texture. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a texture that needs to look amazing. It's just representative of, of what that material is. Yeah. So even something like that, you want to make sure it's not abnormally yeah, it's large. It's very low res, but it gets the idea. You know, they can see it. And I was telling Aaron a little while ago that the... Hey, guys. Sorry about that. We had a little bit of a technical difficulty, but we're Oops. back up and running again with John Brock. Uh, John was showing us his estimator extension. We had a question come in about pricing data. Specifically, can you import pricing data or you have to enter it in estimator? Yeah, no, you have to enter it. Right now, the current version, you have to enter all your pricing data in. And we're working on a version that will have a database that will make it a lot, a lot nicer, but I'm at the mercy of programmers. So, uh, And that's actually yeah. something I wanted to call out is John himself is not the programmer no. for this. No. He's the, I'm the I want to call guy. you the brains behind yes. it. Yeah, that's... I'm that's the guy awesome. that's bugging everybody. I want it to do this, and I want it to do that, and make it happen. And I, we call so. those product managers. Yes, yes. <laughs> exactly. It's also kind of like commissioning great work of art. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If John knows what he needs. Someone else, someone else can make it happen. Yeah. But please feel free to email me. I'm always responding to people, with, you know, yeah. variety of questions every day, really. So I'm, I'm, you know, I love to try to help. Great. It's a great community. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> so I had a quick question, John. Um, what is Estimator software right now? $149. So when you're looking at, at Estimator versus other software packages, um, obviously you've done that cost comparison, looked at it. Is, right. That seems like that's pretty inexpensive yeah, pretty compared cheap. to yeah. framing or estimating other softwares out there. Sure, sure. And, it, and, it, and you know, there's other tools that, that come along with it. Like I said, Estimator has got takeoff length and takeoff area. You don't have to model every single stud and that sort of thing. Like I said, you could... You could use takeoff length. I used to do takeoffs by here's my plans, here's a ruler, here's a mm -hmm. here's a calculator, and I would use the lineal footage of walls and do assemblies. You know, right. and then later went to Excel and that sort of thing. But you could do the same thing with takeoff length, and you could take accumulate links of anything. It could be gutters, it could be ridge board, it could be anything. You know, but the point is, you could then take that layer and use the attribute of length of that, and you know, create whatever you want cost wise out of that. So. It's, it's a lot of power to that. And same thing with the estimators, uh, takeoff area uh, lets you accumulate areas the same way. Mm -hmm. But you can also use native tools inside of SketchUp to do the areas. You know? That's awesome. So materials in estimator is sort of like an area tool. Mm -hmm. So you would, you've got to make sure that you don't paint all surfaces of something right. like a slab. You wouldn't, you know, or a wall, you wouldn't want to, you know, put it on every single surface because then it's going to, you know, 
you really screw up your totals. Yeah, so you don't want to paint yeah. backsides or anything yeah, yeah, like yeah. that, or yeah. so it's just the, just the surfaces you want to actually. And you can do some things on a layer, like you know, for instance, the, like subfloor. That's on a layer, and it's not using the. I wanted the whole material to come all the way through. So what you're seeing there, since that's on a layer, is that um, it's using the square footage of that layer, you know, and then dividing it by you know 32 for how many four by eight sheets of plywood and that sort of thing. Right. And then, in, uh, so another thing I do is I actually will cut out the holes for the toilets to see if they're on top of a truss or a joist or something like that. So it's this, the constructability side of things where you, right. you're using it to make sure that you don't have any clashes in the future. Well, hey, speaking of constructability, yeah, that's a fun sounding word. Yeah, I misspelled <laughs> it the first time. So, so uh, talk about, let's talk about constructability. Constructability sure. is not uh, software. This is more of a service that you offer. Right as, right, as a home builder. Yeah, and actually, I, you know, I've been building my houses before I built them for a long time now. And so I, I'm in a peer group of builders, that, you know, from all across the country. And they've always liked what I've done, but, you know, they didn't think that I could do that for them. Mm -hmm. So I've had a few that have hired me to build it before they built it. So, you know, I've been building for 30 years. So, and if I find a problem that if I have a question, they're going to have a question. And it's amazing because, you, you know, you've got architects design the place, right? Structural engineers will come in and put beams and headers and things like that in. And then, you know, you may have a TJI guy or truss manufacturer that are designing the trusses. And then you may have a civil guy that's doing the site plan. And then the builder's kind of in the middle dealing with the discrepancies, you know, discrepancies and the fallouts and the costs. And so, um, you know, the one that I've got up on screen now, I don't know if it's showing, but there's a, a builder that hired me to, um, to model this house before it was built. And I'm constantly finding clashes. So, you know, I modeled his house. Like if you looked at, um, uh, there was hard slabs. So I used the structural guy's plans. There's a hard slab for a masonry fireplace in here and here and over in this area. But I got the plans from the TJI guy that look like this. It's two dimensional. You know, you're not mm -hmm. going to see conflicts like that. And um, so I took, it was very well done, but I basically modeled everything in here brought it over into uh, back into SketchUp and then you can see all these TJIs and beams were running right through you know the concrete and then of course I keep going back to this one right here that says must be approved by a builder before ordering <laughs> because th he's holding you know, the book yeah he's the one that's paying for this thing so that one mistake alone saved him some money but I also I modeled his site so I took the, the site plan and when I modeled the site um, I knew when I first saw it that the, the subfloor elevation was only six inches above the ground elevation. Well, they've got a 12-inch floor system and all that kind of stuff. So when I modeled it, you could see graphically in 3D. We see it in 3D, so why not model see it in 3D? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of that, how do you communicate these things that you find to them? Um, so I've used a, uh, a plugin that I've created that I'd love to hear some feedback if anybody's interested in it. It's not on the market. I haven't put it out there yet, but it's called Issue Tracker. And so what you can do is if when you find an issue like, like we're seeing here, is I can just take this little tag out here and, and uh, I click on it and place it in there. And then I can say, okay, where the location is, the category, maybe it's structural, we'll type out what the issue is. And what that does, it actually creates a scene, a SketchUp scene. It also lets you create a thumbnail image of that if you were oh, using cool. a PDF maker or something like that. But then I can go to layout and actually don't have to retype all that kind of stuff. I can actually use the smart data that was assigned to that over in layout so they graphically can see. It's not a report saying, hey, we have an issue with your foundation. They can see what it is and go, oh, I get it. There's dirt eight inches up on the, on the wood. I love that because you're leveraging all the detail you've already drawn, right. so the problem is very obvious. And I'm not having to write it down and go remember to go back and bullet all those things. So as you see an issue, so this could be used for any any model. Maybe it's in-house, you're, 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 you're a, you know, reviewing what your designer's doing, and you go, hey, you got to fix this, fix that. Yeah. That's so great. that's what that does. But so that, that saved this guy, I mean, a ton of money because <laughs> <laughs> when they had to redo the foundation, uh, basically what they did, um, let's get the actual model. If I go over to the excavation, you can see that now they did a, they did a stem wall that, that they did a ledge for the floor system to sit on, and that allowed them to backfill against right. the house. As so, opposed to making the earth shorter. Or, <laughs> or, or pouring on top of a pre-existing. I mean, this guy was ready to start concrete. Oh, I mean, the crew was literally on. They were, they were drilling the pilings in this particular house. Wow. So, I mean, he was like, That's I don't, a big deal. he said, I can't tell you how much money that saved. So the whole idea is that they save more than they spend on me. 
That's great. That's the concept because I'm building it before they are. So there was a ton of issues too, like you, could, you know, going up through the roof. I showed you, and uh, when I did the roof itself and put the sheathing on there, you can see all these beams are sticking out through the roof. <laughs> Something's not right there. Yeah, that's an issue. Well, I mean, you know, the structural guy put these 18 and 20 inch uh, LVL beams, and the heel height on on that, like if I cut off the the uh, roof sheathing. The heel height on these rafters is only four and a quarter inches. Well, that's a serious problem. That shows up something's not going to turn out right. If they just go cut right. the heels off of those, that they're not going to carry the load they're supposed to. So, Or would they? So in other words, or, I had yeah, to go back to the engineer the and question. say, hey, Mr. Engineer, can we clip the corners of these? Right. So we did that really across the board. We, um, I, I went through and did... Um, and you're flipping between the initial model you created and the solution model you created. Right, right. So when I go into see the roof framing now, you can see we actually clipped all those corners. The TGIs were all clipped, and you have to add a little gusset plate on each sure. side. So they're seeing exactly what to expect, but saving a pile of money in the process. Yeah. So this, one, this was a pretty complicated model, and a lot of people look at it going, man, how do you, you know, why do you, <laughs> I've heard it all, but, you know, that just shows you the power of SketchUp. I have people that look at this and go, you can't do that in SketchUp. And, well, yes, you can. Yeah. So, <laughs> but it's, it's exactly what you're going to see. Like this guy, the architect, had this crazy roof going on in front of this house, but I looked at it going, and he had it dead on. And it's two-dimensional, it was all 2D, but he knew what it was going to look like, but I brought it to light because, you know, as a builder, I'm worrying, is this window going to clear? You know, right. I ordered these windows, and I can't go any, can't move them down anymore, and I can't raise them up anymore. So limited options I, there. Yeah, finding out now if he's going to have an issue with that because not every every designer has that stuff already figured out. There's a lot of issues that could come about. So. And even if nothing's wrong, to me it's kind of cool to see, hey, this actually works. Yeah, Just right. proof that what's drawn have, is good. Have you had that happen yet? Have you had somebody say, create a model for me and you went, hey, everything's perfect? No, no. <laughs> the, you know, the, the cool thing too is that you can work with other people. Like if I show you this, this is a, a guy out in Utah that I'm working for. And I don't model these trusses. I mean, people see that and think, God, how did you model? I, I don't do that. These guys are using, like, MyTech or some other kind of software, right? Mm -hmm. And they send me a 3D DWG, or I, I, you know, once I get them to send me the file I want, sometimes it's a two-dimensional file, and i got to work with them to get it. But then I literally will place some, I place these trusses, floor trusses and roof trusses, exactly where they go. And in this case, when I first placed it on there, you can see I got an issue marked. When I had it snapped to the stud, when I came over here, it was hanging off an inch. That's so that told me what happens is these guys will take either framing to framing dimensions or sheathing to sheathing dimensions, mm -hmm. and they use the wrong, you know, right. they interpret it the wrong way. And that's pretty common. It's very common. But you see, if this was a, if this was a flat soffit, you know, the framers would be like, it's not going to matter, it's going to be hidden. But this isn't a flat soffit. This soffit continues to go up. And yeah. so they've got sheathing on the wall there. They're going to hit these studs and have to either cut that back or add some blocking. Sure. Either way, somebody's going to stop and have to deal with something. And so I kept going around. I literally, like I said, I place it somewhere and get started. I get around the back here, and they're not even on the wall. <laughs> that's going to be a big issue. That's going to be a real big issue. And so, you know, that's kind of uh, one of those things where you're going to get a phone call, you know, <laughs> and not a very happy phone call. No. And uh, so these become basically unusable at that point, uh, but this was resolved now. With so th and this was because this was before the trusses were built. Before they were built, this is just taking the initial designs from the truss designer. Yeah, and working from that. This That's is awesome. this is the builder sending me the, the plans to build the model off of, and then sending me getting together with his truss vendor to send that file, and then so you know coming around that we had this one here where this is this is a gable end of this house, but there's a bump out. Well, he's got a truss sitting out there at the end of the bump out. <laughs> just so really that truss belongs right here, and he's got one extra truss. So now you may think, okay, well, we didn't need it. And, you'll, you know, they'll be laying out in the, in, you know, ready to be cut up and thrown in the dumpster or whatever. But when the homeowner comes out there and goes, well, what's that? You know, well, it's a trust we didn't need. That's our spare. Did I pay for that? And, uh, yeah. So it's just, it's, it's eliminating problems before you That's awesome. experience And waste, you know, the less, yeah. Yeah. a little less waste. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So that's just how I've been kind of, you know, and you also can see, issues where I run into where there's no bearing wall or bearing walls where there's no foundations and things like that. So it's, it really comes in handy. Just any to, more questions? Keep them coming. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so we're talking again, we're talking to John Brock uh, about his estimator extension and his constructability service he's offering as a builder. So if you have any questions on either of those, shoot them in and uh, John will do his best answer. Yes, I will. <laughs> That's great. Um, so you actually have, uh, these are both services or things you offer. Mm -hmm. um, the 
estimator is available both through Extension Warehouse and through your own website. Right. Which right. is? Uh, it's estimatorforsketchup.com. I can show you that too. Sure. Um, so basically you can either download it here, you can try it out for free, both on their warehouse and on my store. Either one works fine. And um, you know, we have some tutorials and some, some other information on there. I've been busy out building houses and not doing tutorials like I should be, but, but we're trying. The intro video's got a nice little tune, so put your volume up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Copyright free tune. <laughs> and, and actually, that's a really uh, very detailed house that I just finished. And, and SketchUp gave me the ability to show these people everything before it was done. That's awesome. And uh, I created monsters with them because they were constantly wanting to see every little thing. Of course. But they'll tell all their friends at cocktail parties that, you know, we saw it before it was built. We knew exactly. We, had, we were confident because we knew what it was going to look like. That's great. But, like, but then their master suite, you know, uh, this is the tile they're using in the shower. This was the, how they wanted the glass doors to go. This is the color on the vanities that they wanted. This is this rock they wanted behind the vanity you know, itself. And they was able to model all that. And then... Another cool thing about SketchUp is we got all these third-party additional programs that we can use. So I actually put, I, I put myself in that bathroom and, and to Lumion and went into my Lumion and created a virtual tour that That's I could awesome. then send to them. So same thing I'm doing with the framing bit, too. I'm, I'm creating the whole virtual reality tours mm -hmm. and uh, giving them the little glasses to use. They don't have to use the That's big awesome. headset type thing. And uh, so it's just lots of little deliverables that you can give to your people. Something you mentioned was, you know, using extensions. What are, what are the, other than Estimator, right. what are your go-to extensions? What's the extension you cannot live without in SketchUp? Um, I would say probably Dale's uh, Profile Builder. I use it f for so many things. Um, I use it for lumber. I use it for trim, uh, gutters, whatever. Anything that you need to extrude around. And then the cool thing is Estimator will read those linear footages. So you're seeing it modeling it, but getting quantities out of it. That's so awesome. I use that all the time. Um, in addition to other you know, rendering programs and things like that I use, I would say Profile Builder is one of my go-to. There's a ton of extra plugins that guys like Tig have done, you know, like Mirror. I use Mirror all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I probably have a few more. This I is, bet you have some that you don't even realize you're using as yeah, extensions. It's constant, yeah, just... <laughs> yeah it's, it's pretty constant. I've got a, a framing plugin that I'm working on, and I hope I'm not showing that right now because it's not done, but there's, there's some other cool tools that will help speed things up. And speaking sure. of tools, this is, this is something you mentioned you can't yeah. live without. Yeah, man. Your 3D mouse. I don't know if you guys notice how smooth. It's John's like a, a smooth operator. He just, yeah, like a surgeon. Yeah, Look at that. Zoom right up. Oh, zoom so right much. Up. So yeah. nice. So smooth. You're not sitting there, you know, scrolling the wheel constantly right. and switching from O to H and all that good right. stuff. Is so, that, just, so when you, do you actually take your customers through SketchUp models and do you actually like, will they come sit down with you and walk through it together? Sure, sure. Yeah, I, if they're in my office, I do. Um, but it, it, it's hard to know what deliverable to give a client, mm -hmm. especially, you know, I build for retirees and a lot of them are, they're not going to want to go into a 3D model. Right. They want to see it, but they don't want to necessarily go in it. Um, some of the things that I do, like I've, I've done this for a, a builder in Memphis. This is another plugin that I created called uh, Spin360, which I'm working on right now and I haven't put it out. But You're a busy guy. <laughs> well, it's because I wanted to be able to spin a house around, for instance, and it could be spinning a car around or a bike or any product. Any you SketchUp know. model. Yeah, any SketchUp model. So it creates these scenes that then can be put into a, a stitching software that you can then spin the house around. Right. So this client wanted to pick out their colors and pick out, like this was originally lap siding and they didn't like that. They wanted to see it with board and batten that sort of thing in different, you know, what Sherwin-Williams paint color they wanted to use. Mm -hmm. But what I do is I turn around and give them a, um, I, I put this up online, I stitch it together and I can put the builder's logo in there and then they can be spinning it on their phone or on their computer or on their cool. iPad. And see so exactly. that, that takes out the, uh, the issue of the software and it's, it's right. just that. It's a simple that deliverable. I mean, they're sitting there spinning that house around. I do this with on my houses that I build. And I know I put all the gutters and everything on there, exact how it's going to look. And I'll just send, for instance, that's a small thing, but my gutter guy, I'll send him the file. I don't have to go out there and show him where every downspout goes. He can sit there and go, yeah, let you that's study awesome. it from every angle. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Let's we'll jump questions? back into SketchUp. So uh, there's a question here from, uh, let's see, is it Nickel? Uh, and I think he might be talking about Make Unique. I'm just guessing on his. So his question is, can we scale one particular object where there are more than one objects? but he only wants to scale one of them. So one option is if they're all components, you could make one of them unique. Mm -hmm. Do what you have to do to that one. I'm not quite sure if that's what he means, but... Um, 
Well, that's actually a good question. What will that do with your estimate then, Will? Okay, let me, let me show you kind of how that can work. If we go into, um, for instance, this main floor walls, you know, I've got studs in here um, that are of a particular length. Probably not something you'll scale, but. Yeah, well, but when you go over to a jack, it's, I'm still cutting it out of a stud, right? right? And so um, I used that, made it unique, mm -hmm. and pushed it down to fit underneath the header. So it's the same, it was the same stud to start with. It now became a unique component. And then an estimator, I still want to report that out as a stud. Um, the waste is the, you know, that you're cutting off of it is just waste. But, so it's just maybe a quantity you, at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's cool. So that's, that's using one component, making it unique, and making it work for other things. So. Uh, someone just logged on and asked about what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And just to give a reminder for those new viewers, uh, we're discussing Estimator for SketchUp, an extension by John Brock. Yep. So that's where we're at right now. Yeah. All right. So oh, we, yeah, and I had one other question, yeah. too. Mm -hmm. Just in general, as you've been modeling these houses like this in a lot of detail, uh, any SketchUp things you've kind of figured out, make maybe you know, little tips you've figured out or things you've done oh, that definitely. make yourself faster? Sure, that sure. People might care about. Um, so, well, there's, there's basically four ways to estimate with Estimator. You have either components, like the stud is a component, for instance. You'll have layers. So um, I, I think of layers of something that's maybe a slab, uh, lineal footage of lumber, things that you, you, they have to be on their own layer in order to get Estimator to, to uh, be able to assign something differently. You wouldn't want to put everything on one layer because it's a different entity or a different uh, item. Uh, so like this subfloor, for instance, is on a layer. So if I was to click on that, you can see that it's subfloor. Then I use the attribute of area and say, okay, just a simple math, you know, you can divide it by well, I've got multiple things that you can add in there. So it's the subfloor itself, you divide by 32 because it's a four foot, eight, four foot by eight foot sheet. You could put waste in there and then see how many sheets. That's 36 sheets. But then you can further take that and add as many associated costs as you want. So you can say, okay, I want to take the area of it and I came up with a multiplier for how many screws that it takes to screw down the subfloor just by looking at past wow. data and going, okay, well, we used three boxes on this job and it was how many square feet and we used, you know, just took like five or six jobs to get a number that would work. And I'm sure this, this data is, could be found online too, you know. Um, but then you can keep adding as many costs as you want or as many associated costs, subfloor adhesive. Yeah. And so then the next time that's I go all, That's all based on one number then. Yeah. So the next time I go and model subfloor, I would instantly have all that stuff. So if I was to click a report on that, then I could see that it's 36 sheets of subfloor. Here's my screws and my glue. And so it's completely customizable. Uh, and then the other way is material. So think of materials as an area tool. So you apply a, a shingle texture to the roof, and then everything that's associated with that area or that, uh, uh, that material, then we'll use that total area, the SketchUp area, and uh, use a multiplier for how many squares of shingles that you need and that sort of thing. I'm not sure if our viewers uh, know that tip, but you can, if you uh, click on a texture in SketchUp, you can find out the area right. of that texture in your model. Yeah so, this, it's, yeah, so if you were to look at the um, roof itself, so if you were to drill into any one of these, it's actually going to try to chug things this, down. That's something we should point that out, too, is you do have the option of estimating on the push of a button, or you can just constantly right. be updating your estimates. Right, so it shows in the entity info what the area is, but yes, if you went into estimator, it should give you that same area if you're looking at materials. It's basically seven squares of shingles on that one area right there. But yes, this is, uh, this is real-time estimating. So it's, I, I wanted this to all live in one file. So everything, is, everything you do in this one file of SketchUp is going to be able to be reported. But, um, but yeah, you can cut that off in your settings and cut off real-time reporting. So when you get into these big models, you can really start chugging things down. So you can just cut off the real-time reporting and eliminate that issue. That's cool. Uh, the last thing is, you, is quotes. So again, you're not going to have, you don't want to model a dumpster or a portable <laughs> toilet or anything like that or labor. How do you do that kind of stuff? Right. So quotes lets you enter as many quotes as you want for general conditions or labor or anything like that. So the whole Just idea, item. yeah. Just. So the whole idea is when you're done and I get everything in the model and even the site, I, you know, how much sod's going down. I can use the area of the grass for that. Same for the driveway, how much asphalt, um, that sort of thing. And then of course this one had a boat dock on it, but you select everything that you want reported, and it's going to take a second for estimator to crunch all the numbers. Meanwhile, Freddie says he loves SketchUp. Cheers, Freddie. We love you, Freddie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so while that's, while that's going, a uh, question came in about landscape, about that topography. How, where, where do you get your topography information from models? That's a great question. So um, 
we'll look at that. Uh, Your constructability model had. Yeah, the constructability model had it. So if we look at uh, this, even this one has. Uh, I'll be given the getting the contours out of this. So let's see if I have those in here. So if I go to layers. All right, so if you go to layers, I've got a layer that has my contour. So you can see these are the existing contours on this side. Okay. All right, so um, what I do is I use a sandbox tool or topo shaper. I use mm -hmm. that a lot. So these contours, now I get these contours from, typically I get them from my surveyor. So uh, if they do a topo analysis, a lot of times I'll get the topo, the contour lines from them. But you can also uh, create them from scratch. So you get that, um, is that, is that a CAD file that comes in yeah. a 3D file and you just pull those lines? Imp import it into SketchUp and then you can select those contour lines and use a sandbox tool, tool to, from contours, create mm -hmm. that skin. Uh, there's a plugin called Topo Shaper. It's a great plugin. Mm -hmm. I use it all the, all the time. And what Topo Shaper will do is actually put the skirt that you see here to it. Uh, the only difference is I, I actually edited it to close it to where it would be a solid. Mm -hmm. Um, because I model the before sites and I model the after the site. Okay. So you can For get dirty. an idea of cut and fill instead of telling your client, hey, you, you, know, you might have to haul some dirt in or you might have to haul some dirt away. Nice. Um, I can give them quantities. Like this, uh, this site right here, when I ran the before site and after site, I don't know if I have this. It's been a long time since I've been in there. So see, like this is the proposed or the ex existing site that was out there. Maybe not so you can see. Well, that's actually at the excavated site. Okay. Okay. Oh, so this is before and the last. This one is the... That's the existing site. That's what it started with. Okay. All right. So when you look at it, it's got a volume being reported, and then I can compare those two volumes and get a, an idea. But this particular job, it was like nine truckloads or ten truckloads of dirt is what it came up to. So the day I did the backfill. Coming or going? To come in, to okay. backfill with. So I had to add that to my budget, right? That's a, that's a big deal. I mean, deal. that's a number. That's not a whole lot for that house, but some of them get up to ten or $15,000 worth of dirt. You're either hauling off or you're hauling in. <laughs> And so this gave me an idea. That's so we awesome. were backfilling that day, and we brought in nine truckloads of dirt, and it got dark on us. And we stopped. I thought, well, I'll see if I can live with that. You know, at the end of the job, I had to bring one more truckload of dirt in. So, uh, but yeah, the site modeling, um, you can uh, you can get a lot of information out of that, and just awesome. using a lot of the existing tools. You know, the either yeah. either sandbox tools or um, or using something like Topo Shaper. So. Yeah, we do have actually a skill builder file up there that addresses <clears throat> both those things: how to take lines and either make. Uh, a final model from sandbox or topo shaper. So yeah, that's like perfect. this is the one we were looking at in the constructability, and mm -hmm. that's where I could see so the, the existing topo lines were dashed, mm -hmm. and the proposed are solid. Oh, and cool. I did not have this in a CAD file, but it wasn't that big of a site, so I literally just traced over top of it, and um, and then moved the contours up into position. So, you know, you you got to do a little bit of work to get there. And so what I did is that these are at five hundred and. 50 some odd feet above sea level, and I just moved them up 50 feet, 56, 58, and that sort of thing. Didn't have to go 500 feet up in the air to do that. <laughs> For something <laughs> like uh, you know dirt and, and ground tracing pixelated data to me is totally fine. You're yeah. getting pretty close, and you know that's going to give you a good. good it's going to be a good representation. Right. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. I literally just traced over top of these, and I just use lines. But then, oh, there's a plugin called Weld. Mm -hmm. Use Weld. Very good. Weld. So I would trace over top of those contour lines, like you're seeing in there, and then. Triple click on it, selects every one of those that are that are joined, and then hit weld, and it becomes one polyline. And then I move that one polyline up into position. That's great. And I make sure again, everything's got to be on a layer for me, that so I can control its visibility. So those went on a layer for existing contours and a layer for proposed contours. That's cool. And back to that other question, that's that's good to do that stuff right when you're creating the geometry. So even if you're not quite sure how you're going to use your final model, it's always good to organize that stuff up front. That way, when time comes, you can easily pick apart the model, turn things on or off, and right. it's a good way to model. And I've got a template that's got all that stuff in it. So, you know, and again, it it's, it's something that's proprietary, not proprietary, but in a sense that it works for me. Yeah. Everybody's going to have their own right. uh, systems and processes. <laughs> but somebody asked how much time did it take a model like this. I, you know, for a house like the one that you're seeing in this example model that I did. And this, this was one, the one with everything. Everything. Model. I mean, Absolutely. everything is in it down to even you know, stuff on the inside, it, all the interior finishes. And here's a cool example of dynamic components. My wife hates TVs in the room when I want a TV in the room. <laughs> She's an artist, and that's one of her paintings. So I was able to use one of her paintings in there. But it's a dynamic component. So if you were to click on that, it's on a lift. So it goes up. <laughs> yeah, so those I get the that, geek award. Uh, pull up that toolbar, the, you know, the view uh, toolbars thing. Oh. 
dynamic components. There's a couple. There's like three. I think there's three buttons there, and oh, that's just the yeah. that's the activate. There it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the activate button. That just uh, mm -hmm. if something has an action to it, it'll yeah. For instance, action. the you finger know, button. Yeah, the finger button. So doors. I'll make uh, if I go inside here. I'll make a door open and close. You know, because I may have a, a rendering where I want it open or I want it closed. That's, That's great. Sort of thing. It's a lot easier than going in and yeah. rotating. And there's that. a ton of YouTube. I mean, the way I learn all this stuff is YouTube. You know, watching you guys and, and Mike Brightman and guys like that. That you know, how do you make a door swing? And, and it's a lot of trial and error. But but uh, and then the same token, I can assign prices. And somebody in SketchUp World created all these electrical outlets and switches, like you're seeing in this model. Really, really Three detailed. And right? man, when I go and render those things, they look great but I don't cut out the drywall yet people think I'd probably take it to that degree but <laughs> it just sticks out a half inch so that when you render it it's it's gonna be perfect there. and a quick tip on those doors if you're a little intimidated by making a door you know from scratch like that you actually could just go to the warehouse download one that ha that has that dynamic yes. action and replace the geometry so go in there and edit the door to your however you want it to be and it will still perform that that action so or just better yet dissect it and learn how to do dynamic culture yeah. yourself. step, step right. two yeah yeah right right <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how I did them. I, I didn't. I didn't do it from scratch. I took somebody else's that's thing. That's right. So yeah, it's it's fully detailed. Um, so this model uh, took probably about a week, would be my guess. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that time is spent assigning cost data to these things. Right. You know, and it's it's all a disciplined approach. Um, it's garbage in, garbage out. You know, and you in no sticky geometry. Make sure everything is on a group or on a, or in a, to a component. Then if you're making a component, be careful to realize that if you copied it over here and you manipulate <laughs> it, you're changing something off the screen that, you know, so there's probably a lot of frustration that people deal with, but learning the differences yeah. between groups and components, but. So your, your constructability models, just because we don't know who, who he was talking, or which uh, model he was talking about, your constructability models, how much time do those take in general? When you create those just frames. Yeah, see, see those, are just, those are just structural models for the most part. Now, That's this one, quick. yeah, like uh, the one that I did here for this guy in Utah, um, you know, the, I didn't model the trusses, I brought them in. Sure. Now, when I do bring them in, um, when I first bring them into SketchUp, in fact, that's what these actually look like. They're the colors and everything. I typically, most of the times I get them, they're the default white, mm -hmm. and then I'll take the time to texture them. But I use TomTom's Cleanup, that's mm -hmm. another plugin I use a lot. Um, and that helps to reduce a lot of unnecessary geometry to them. Yeah. And then, um, but then I'll save them as their own SketchUp file and I'll scale them. Because most of the time, almost every trust that comes in or when I get some of these things, they're, they're off by a factor of 12, mm. you know, 12 times it. So I just scale it down 0.0833 and it scales everything down to fit. Like you've done that once or twice I've before. I've done times, 0.0833. <laughs> so. And there was a question that I saw Cruz about earlier. I forgot about it. Uh, I think they just asked, uh, at what point do you color your components? And the short answer is it doesn't really matter, but if you want to just jump into to one of your components there and, and show that the, the best practice is to apply a material or a color directly to the face. Yeah, and, and that's something that you guys can probably explain better as far as what's right and what's wrong. I don't want to tell the wrong way. I, I typically texture my models as soon as I can uh, because I want to see what it looks like by adding, yeah. you know, I can tell that that subfloor, and I can tell that these, this is more like an LVL beam. is different from the SPF stuff, and I've got the treated plates that are green, you know, mm -hmm. I want to know right from the start how it's going to look. So well, that's, that's important. I mean, as you're right. building up, you don't have to go back then and dissect your model, put those colors in right. as you're creating, but especially like I said, if they are components, then you color that first one and then that good to done. go. Yeah. yeah. And then talk about extension or the uh, 3D warehouse, I even picked up some of these hold downs and joist hangers and things like that that you can put in these models. So And those will actually get taken off with estimator as, as quantities. Yeah. 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 And that's yeah. one of the things we're talking we were talking about that before, but you can in estimator you can actually take off square, cubic, lineal, or quantities right. for anything in any, the model. Any attribute, you know, length, area, or volume and, or individual quantities. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's a lot that can be done with it. But it, it all begins with all the basic tools that you guys give us. So that's awesome. it's just how how far you want to take it from there. Uh, but some of the constructability reviews, I try to keep these down. It's, we're not about, uh, some of them want to take it past and see the full model. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's builders that, you know, and that's what I learned from dealing with my guys in the builder group that I'm in. They're like, you know, that really looks cool and all, but who's paying for that? You know, so when it comes down to something like this, that's when the light went off and they went, you know, that's going to save me money. Right. You know, I don't care what color it is. <laughs> Tell me how I'm going to save some money. Sure. And so that's where this constructability idea was born. So That's great. 
Well, again, guys, we're here with John Brock. He's shown us some of his workflow stuff with his constructability models, his extension estimator. Um, got him for a few more minutes, so if you have questions, shoot him in now, and, and we'll try to ask him before I'm his time's up. Seeing a question now about wall framing. Um, Thanks, Matt. Got a question there? Yeah. So I'm in a transition time right now. So the way that I've been framing my uh, wall framing has been to use Profile Builder, to, and that's what I'll show you in a... In, what you can currently do now with what's available. So if I go into this model here and say, uh, let's go to main floor framing, for instance. All right, if I was to uh, click on my, if, hide rest of model, great, great tool if you don't know how to, you know, what that does. When you go to edit a group or a component, I have, I use shift H and it can, hides the rest of the model and then I can cut it back on. But then you can see what's in that particular group. So what you're seeing here is all lineal footage items. Mm -hmm. So my, my top plates, my bottom plates, my sills, the cripple studs, the headers, everything is on their own layers, but they're in this one group. And that way I can control its visibility. And then the studs are individual components that get moved around and associated that way. So that's how I've had to do it. And yes, I've had to actually move copy studs on 16 inches on center and, and that sort of thing. But uh, I'm, I'm working on a plug-in now that will allow it, so I'll just kind of show you briefly. You'll be able to pick the wall size that you want, how you want your wall to start and end. Um, maybe you want three studs at the end. Your height of the wall, what your spacing is, nine foot, one and an eighth. And then you'll just be able to tr trace and you'll have a wall. And then you can add openings in it too by, say, want to do a window in there, I want uh, Say a two two by ten header, you put in uh, your sizes of parameters, width, height, header height, and then just pick where you want it, and it'll put it in there for you and actually cut everything else out. And this is a huge time saver. Yeah, that's enormous. <laughs> it, it was taking me, you know, maybe four or five hours to frame a house that I could, you know, do in half an hour, forty five minutes. But it's still under work. So I've paid a guy a large sum of money to do this much, and <laughs> we're not done yet. And uh, I want, it has to work with Estimator, too, so that's where we're going with that. We had a, a framing question come in. Yes. Roberto asked if you recommend double sill plates on windows. You know, I, as a habit, I did that for years, overkill. I'm, wait, I'm going to exclaim this. This is an opinion of John. It does not directly <laughs> reflect the opinions of Trimble or SketchUp. There you go. <laughs> okay. Disclaimer. Um, I used to do double sills. I used to do overkill on my framing. You know beefed up headers and things like that. But with green building now, it's more of a try to save some, you know, if you don't need to do a double sill, why do it? Right. Ironically, in that plugin that I was just showing you, I have that as an option. Do you want a single sill or a double <laughs> sill? That, yeah. And uh, that's why that's there. But lately, I've been trying to back off of that. I've been doing California corners where instead of loading up three right. two by fours at the end, you do turn one off to the side. You're saving a stud at every corner. Right. So, and it's really huge in, in a whole house. Well, how much that will save you. And that's, that's a big deal, too, because framing changes per location, per job, per type. Per, I mean, there, there's a million different ways to frame anything, yeah. and everybody you ask has the right way to do it. Oh, yeah. So uh, it's pretty cool that your software is, is looking like it's going to be flexible as far as how it's going to frame that stuff. You yeah. have the option on it. And it's a parametric framer, but it's not, it's not like you can just trace around the whole house and poof, there's your framing. Right. It's, it's more wall by wall. And it, it, actually, I didn't show you, but you can cut on sheathing. Oh, wow. Inside and outside, and it's already cut out the openings and stuff like That's that. Because awesome. right now, to do the sheathing that you see here, I literally put a face on there, pulled it out a half inch, or cut out the windows, pushed them in, you know, that sort of sure. thing. So it, it definitely takes time, and so we're always looking for time saving measures. So, so there's, you showed a lot of stuff. I mean, some of the stuff, estimators available there, your constructability website is out there. Mm -hmm. But you've also talked about some stuff that's not there your issue tracker, mm -hmm. your framing plugins you're working on. Um, if people want to give you input, which you said you love input, love it, yeah. um, if they want to be kept up to date on this, how's the best way to do that? I mean, do they just email me. It's I got so many different email addresses. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything on here now, but John at estimatorforsketchup.com is one way. Estimator for SketchUp. And that link's probably in your Estimator for SketchUp website. Yeah, it's on there. Okay. That's that, that's the contact. Uh, and there's BrockworksInc.com. So uh, there's a couple different ones. Yeah, he's a busy guy. There's all kinds of ways to get a hold of him. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we did have a question about purchasing in U.S. dollars. Um, oh. good, good question, because that was the first <laughs> thing I learned when I first released Estimator. I had, you know, dollars down there, dollar symbol. So I got a question from somebody in the U.K. the first week going, well, 
you know, how can we, <laughs> how can I do uh, euros or, or pounds or something? So what you do is over in the settings, we came up with this little currency formatting where you can change the symbol uh -huh. and you can change the separators, whether it's a you know, comma or a dot or whatever. Yeah. And, it's, and it, works, it works well. So you can change whatever your symbol is, which is usually the symbol, but some different currencies will change. I that. had no idea that that was a thing. Yeah. I learned yeah. that not I learned too long that the ago hard too. Way. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, this is not, you don't have to worry about converting uh, currencies in this. It's one to one. If you're, mm -hmm. if you're working in euros, it's one euro each or whatever. So the formatting for the, the currency was the big thing. So awesome. the symbol itself. So Very hopefully cool. that worked. Awesome. All right. Well, that's all the questions I'm, I'm seeing there. You have anything else Probably. you want to ask, Josh? Or? No. Thank you guys for your time. Thanks yeah. for having me here. This is awesome. This, is, this has been great. I've, I've learned some things. I, I think one closing remark is if, you're, if you just joined us or maybe you're looking at this and it looks complicated, just keep in mind that we're showing you know, a pretty complicated use in, in terms of the SketchUp model, but Estimator can be applied to simple projects. Yeah. So I think this is a good way to show us something that's a little bit crazy, a little bit complex, a whole house. Right. right. But you can do things that are much simpler, and Estimator could be a really fast way for you to really just reel off some information that you need from that 3D model. Right. And this I, is like I, the I probably over, model. I overcomplicate things all the time, so that's just <laughs> a habit. But yes, it can be very, very simplified. It can be your basic SketchUp models with just pulling up a wall and cutting out a window and wanting to know the area of the walls for drywall or paint or Perfect. anything like that. It's, it's as simple or as complicated as you want to make it. That's nice. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, John, for coming. Yes, thank you guys thank you. for watching. And, uh, it was fun. Yeah. Thanks, John. Thank you. We'll see you later, and we'll see you guys later. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you.